Today, we are week two of this series called Rebuilt, where we've been looking at, at this idea that, that when we experience Jesus and we start to follow him, he, he actually starts to rebuild our lives. Or how about this? He, he starts to change our lives. He, he doesn't just fix the broken parts of us. He gives us a whole new life, a rebuilt life. And last week, if you weren't here, uh, we took this like fun survey where we looked at like your deepest sins and brokenness that you don't want to tell anybody. And some of you are like, is he kidding right now? No, I'm not kidding. And we don't do that every week. You missed it, okay? Uh, You can go back online to check that out. But um, we looked at this, that broken things cannot rebuild themselves. We know that's true, right? Broken things cannot rebuild themselves. And so when our lives are broken, the church, this place, this community is where broken people are being rebuilt. This is the the community God chooses to use for broken people to be rebuilt. Now, again, if you missed last week, go back online, hope for nwa.city slash messages and check out last week. I think it'll it'll show you what type of church that I walk in here today. Like, is it really okay for me to be dealing with that? And the answer is yes, because there's a whole bunch of us that are walking through a lot of stuff in life, as we found out last week. And what we found is that Jesus specializes in rebuilding broken lives. And so last week we talked about this, that we're rebuilt from brokenness, but Jesus doesn't just leave us there, right? He doesn't leave us in our brokenness. He actually wants to bring us from brokenness into something that he's created us for. See, God always leads us into something greater that he wants for us in life. So think about this. If you were around last weekend, we did this survey where we looked at all these parts of our lives that we go, man, they're, they're not working the way that we wish that they did, or they haven't in the past, and maybe they're changing now. And we also found out that there's a whole bunch of others in this room that are going through the same types of things. You know, what could God want for us in those areas of life? You know, what, what, what could God want for us? Not, not want from us, but what would he want for us in the middle of our mental health stuff? Uh, what, what could God want for me if I wasn't constantly ashamed of some, some things going on in my life? What could God want for me in the area of addictions or relationships or sexuality or identity or the parts of my life that I've never shared with anybody? What could God want for me if I had raw honesty before him and before others that I'm broken and Jesus is rebuilding my life? What could God possibly want for me in those areas? And so that's what we're going to look at today, that today we are being rebuilt for boldness. We are being rebuilt for boldness. In fact, brokenness is the tool that Jesus may just want to use in your life to rebuild you and make you bold. And so if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in John chapter 21 today. You can turn there. uh, You can Google John 21 if you're not sure where it is or you don't own a Bible, or it'll be up here on the screens in the next few minutes. But um, man, last week we looked at this idea that when Jesus rebuilds us, he often renames us. He gives us a new identity. And we looked at this guy named Levi who became Matthew. Matthew, a gift of God. And this week we're going to look at a guy named Simon who's going to be renamed by Jesus Peter. And that just means rock. But in John 21, when we meet Peter, here's the reality. Jesus has already renamed him, but that rock, he feels like he's been crushed. He's not the rock that he thought he was. He's a broken version of the man that he thought that he was in that moment. And we're going to take a look at that in a minute. But what Jesus is going to do in John 21 is he's going to actually use Peter's brokenness to rebuild him for boldness. So let me give us a little background on Peter so we're all on the same page here. We all know who we're talking about. When, when Jesus met Peter, his name was Simon. He, he was a blue-collar fisherman who failed out of school, who got into fights, who cussed a little bit and put his foot in his mouth more often uh, than not. Can anybody identify with that kind of description? He, he was one of the first four people who started following Jesus. And then Jesus, from the time he sees him, he kind of looks him up and down. He sizes him up and he goes, hey, I just want you to follow me. And and, and as you follow me, I'm going to give you a new name. I'm going to help you become something greater, someone greater than you ever thought you'd be. You're going to be called Peter from here on out. You're going to be called Rock, which when you think about it, that's a pretty bad nickname. I I have to wonder if you grew up watching like late 90s, early 2000s wrestling, like did did the Rock's theme song start playing? Do you smell what the Rock is cooking every time Peter walked in the room? I don't know, ADD there. But so Simon Peter, he spends 18 months following Jesus and trusting him kind of on and off. See, he drifts between being tight with Jesus and then going back to his old way of life, going back to fishing. Until one day, Jesus invites him to leave fishing altogether and to come fish for people, which was Jesus' way of saying, hey, come do this work alongside me. Spend the rest of your life teaching people about how good I am and inviting them to follow me. So Peter starts off, he's like, that sounds great, Jesus. But only a couple weeks later, what we find is that the rock isn't so steady because we find him back fishing again. And after a night of catching no fish, Jesus 
He goes, hey, you guys haven't caught anything. Throw your nets out on the other side of the boat. And Jesus provides this massive catch of fish. You can read all about it in Luke chapter 5. And in that moment, Peter's faced with his own brokenness, his own failure. And he falls to his knees and he goes, Jesus, you messed up. I know you called me to be a fisher of men. You called me Peter, but I'm not the rock that you think I am. Have you ever been there? Peter goes, I'm a sinful man. Get away from me. See, that's what happens when we come face to face with our own sin and shame and brokenness is we think we don't deserve the life that Jesus has invited us into, the life that he has made for us. And so Jesus says to Peter in that moment, he goes, yeah, that happened, but Peter, get up because I've got a life for you. Follow me and I'll make you fishers of, uh, a fisher of men. I'll, I'll restore you for what or I'll rebuild you for what I intended for your life. And then just a few chapters later, what you're going to find, or a few uh, maybe months or so later, Peter makes this declaration for the first time ever. Hey, Jesus, we believe you're the Christ. You're the Son of the living God. You're the Savior we've been looking for. And Jesus goes, Peter, again, remember, you're the rock. You're going to be a key part of this. On the foundation of who I am, I'll build the church, but you're going to be part of helping see this movement start. You with me so far? But then Peter, the rock... Here's what happens. He continues to mess it up along the way. Right after he makes this declaration of who Jesus is, Jesus starts to lay out this plan of how it's going to happen by saying, I'm going to go to the cross. My plan is to redeem the world through my death for their sins so that everyone can re experience this rebuilt life. And Peter goes, no, 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 no. That's a bad plan, Jesus. You shouldn't ever tell anybody that. And then in the next breath, Jesus says to Peter, hey, get behind me, Satan. I mean, can, can you imagine Jesus calling him Satan in that moment because Peter just doesn't get it yet. And then the night before Jesus goes to the cross, Peter's going to face maybe one of his greatest moments of, of, of brokenness. He goes, Jesus, I love you so much. I'll go to the cross and I'll die for you. But then by the time the night's over, it's, he's ended up falling asleep when Jesus needed him the most. He denies Jesus three times and then he runs away scared and is nowhere to be found when Jesus is hung on the cross and laid in the tomb. See, what Peter, it appeared that he had on the surface was this. It appeared that he had boldness, right? But it turns out it wasn't boldness. It was actually arrogance. See, Peter was an arrogant man. In arrogance, Peter said, I can provide for myself better than you can, Jesus, so I'm going to go back to fishing. Or how about this? Jesus, don't, don't follow the plan to the cross. I know better than you do for how you're going to carry out this thing. How about this? Jesus, I love you so much. I love you so much more than everyone else. I'm willing to die with you. See, what Peter may have felt was boldness was actually arrogance. And his arrogance broke him. And there's a difference between boldness and arrogance, isn't there? See, arrogance is having an excessive pride in oneself and a contempt for others, thinking that you're better than other people. While boldness is courageous and it's daring, and instead of thinking you're better, it moves on behalf of others. Arrogance relies on my own abilities and what I bring to the table and my efforts, where boldness comes from a source of strength that's greater than myself. See, Peter said, in arrogance, I can provide for my family and myself better than you can, Jesus. I know better than you. The cross is a bad plan. And Jesus, I can go all the way to the death with you. And that's where his arrogance broke him. Because he denied Jesus and he ran away when it mattered most. His arrogance broke him. But Jesus came to call Peter from his brokenness into boldness. In fact, it's going to be Peter's brokenness that Jesus is going to use to rebuild his life for boldness. You with me? All right, John chapter 21. Let's jump into this together. John chapter 21, starting in verse 1, it says, Afterward, Jesus appeared to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. And so we're going to learn that this was the third time that Jesus appeared to his disciples after he had died and, and resurrected. It was the third time since Peter had denied Jesus three times. It's the third time that Peter has seen Jesus and interacted with him since his moment of greatest failure in denying Jesus. And they're by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter uh, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, who are James and John, and two other disciples, they were all together. And they said, I'm going out to, or Peter goes, I'm going out to fish. And they go, hey, we'll go with you. So Peter goes back into his brokenness. Hang on to that for a minute. So they went out and they got in the boat. But that night they fished all night and they caught absolutely nothing. See, Peter the rock, after denying Jesus three times, he's still broken. He's still not seeing that even though Jesus is back from the dead, that he will provide for him, that he will take care of everything that Peter needs. In fact, Peter, and maybe this is good news for you and me here today, Peter won't fully get it until Acts chapter 2 when the Holy Spirit comes. See, it takes a work of God in our lives for us to understand God's heart and his life and his intentions for us. So Peter goes back to Simon. Simon goes back to what he knows. 
He goes back to fishing. And he takes six other guys with him. Think about that. In our brokenness, isn't it easy just to go back to the familiar? Isn't it easy just to go back to, man, it's always going to be this way. It's never going to get better. But here's the good news. It's from a broken and humble place that Jesus can lead us from brokenness into boldness. Verse 4, it says, early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. And then he called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they said. And I think this is like your buddy who heckled you from the sidelines when you're playing sports or whatever. That's what that looked like. In verse 6, he goes, hey, throw your net out on the other side of the boat and you'll find some fish there. And I don't know why they did it. They'd fished all night and they didn't get any. But when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. In fact, it'll say later that they counted them up and they had 153 fish. I don't know how many fish that is, you know, outside of 153, what that looks like. But I went fishing this week and I caught eight. 153 is a lot of fish. So flash back to when Jesus initially called Peter to be a fisher of men. Remember, they'd spent all night fishing, and they hadn't caught anything in Luke chapter 5. And this moment takes them back in time, I have to believe, to that moment, to a flashback of what Jesus originally intended for Peter's life. And again, Luke 5, you can go read it on your own. But what Jesus is doing for Peter in this moment is he's meeting him right in his brokenness, and he's going to start rebuilding Peter's life. And he's going to rebuild him from his brokenness for boldness. So John, who was there, recognizes right away. He goes, it's Jesus. Don't you remember? He's done this before. It's Jesus. And Peter taking off his shirt to fish, and it says that he put it back on because Jesus can't catch me with my shirt off, and he hops in the water and swims to shore where Jesus is cooking breakfast. In verse 9, it says, when they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with some fish on it and some bread. And so Jesus just invites them to sit down over a meal. I mean, I I love this about Jesus. He meets them in their physical need first before he moves on to restore them spiritually. Think about it. They've been out fishing all night. They're hungry. And when you first wake up in the morning and you're hungry and you haven't had breakfast or coffee yet, maybe you're like me and you're just a little bit hangry. And Jesus is going, hey, no, in that moment, I want to just sit down and have a meal with you first. And then we'll talk about that other stuff going on. Now, that phrase that I've got underlined there, Fire of burning coals, it's really important to this story. It may not seem like it on the surface, but that literally translates charcoal fire. Charcoal fire. And it's only used twice in the whole Bible. It's used once here in John 21, and it's used once in John 18, verse 18. And in John 18, 18, you can go look this up, but Peter is standing around a fire, a charcoal fire, trying to keep warm. While in the background, his friend Jesus has been unfairly arrested and he's being unjustly tried. He's going to go on here in the next few hours. He's going to be beaten within an inch of his life. And ultimately, Jesus would die and go to the cross. And it's around that charcoal fire, again, same word that John uses here, that charcoal fire that Peter denied ever knowing Jesus to begin with. And he didn't just do it once. He did it three times. In fact, he denied Jesus so strongly that the last, the last denial was essentially Jesus telling someone, to hell with you, I've never met the man before. I mean, think about that. And here's the thing about charcoal. It has a really distinct smell, doesn't it? Anybody like cook on a charcoal grill or remember a charcoal grill? When I tell you just think about smelling a charcoal grill, you're probably getting hungry right now, aren't you? But your mind is taking you somewhere. See, that, that, that smell, that scent brings up so many memories for me of my dad grilling out in the backyard as a kid. Or actually, as I was thinking about it this week, it reminds me of one of my earliest memories I've ever had of, of my dad grilling out on the beach after a day at the lake and burning brats on the beach. And I think that we like peeled the burnt stuff off and ate them anyway that day. But like the Old Spice commercial used to say, scent is, is one of the most closely tied senses, or it is the most closely linked sense with our memory. So where do you think the smell of charcoal took Peter that morning? Yeah, it took him right back to the night around that charcoal fire. Just a few days before where he denied his friend Jesus three times. Right back to where his arrogance broke him. See, Jesus is taking Peter back to the point of his greatest Failure and brokenness, not to shame him, but so that he can restore Peter, so he can rebuild him. For what? Well, rebuild him for boldness. Verse 15, when they'd finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Hey, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. So Jesus says, 
feed my lambs. So he takes him back to Simon. He takes him back to who he was before he met Jesus. And he goes, hey, do you love me more than these other disciples? And Jesus is going right after his arrogance in this moment. See, Peter, up to this point, he had a pretty high view of his own loyalty and his own ability to love Jesus. But in denying Jesus, Peter hadn't even been able to live up to his own standard, had he? See, for many of us, our brokenness comes from our inability to live up to the standard that we've set for ourselves and others, doesn't it? And that's the definition of arrogance. It's having excessive pride in oneself. It's thinking that we're more than we actually are. It's actually thinking, I'm broken and I can fix myself. Or maybe worse, I'm not broken and I don't need fixing. See, Jesus is forcing Simon Peter in this moment to learn a hard lesson about arrogance and life change. Peter had been so sure about, of himself before this. He said, Jesus, I love you so much more than everyone around me that I will go to death with you. And then he denied Jesus when it mattered most. So Jesus dives right into the middle of Peter's brokenness. And he goes, do you love me more than these? Do you still love me more than these other disciples like you said earlier? See, for all of us, living a life of boldness means that we first have to come face to face with our own inability to live up to the standard that we've set for ourselves and our own inability to live the life that Jesus has called us into on our own, apart from his power working in our lives. We have to come face to face with this thing that Jesus and the Bible, they call sin. And that's where the rebuilding process starts for us. And it's where it starts for Peter. It's where we start to move from brokenness to what Jesus wants for us. Verse 16, again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he answered, Lord, you know that I love you. And so Jesus goes, take care of my sheep. Now, we shouldn't read too much into this because uh, the Bible uses these two words in Greek pretty interchangeably throughout the New Testament. But both times up to this point when Jesus asked Peter, hey, do you love me? He used uh, the highest form of love available in the Greek language. He said, Peter, do you agape me? Do you agape me? Do you, do you love me with the highest form of love to will the highest good in my direction? Do you love me like that? And so far, Peter has responded this way, not I, ag I agape you, Jesus, but he went down a level and he goes, Jesus, I phileo you, which is just kind of common brotherly love. And what's happening in this moment is Peter's been humbled. He goes, Jesus, I, I just love you as much as like everyone else. I can only love you with a common love. I, I, I can't even love you with the highest form of love. See, Peter's been broken of his arrogance in this moment. And again, I don't think we should read too much into this, but th this is my opinion in this moment. I think that what Jesus is doing by asking Peter, do you agape me, is that Jesus is reminding Peter of the type of love that Jesus has already shown him in his direction. See, Jesus agapes Peter, and he agapes us. He has willed the highest good in our direction, and he's just proven it by going to the cross for Peter's moment of greatest failure, his moment of greatest sin. See, Jesus loves Peter and us with agape love, even when we can't love him back with the same kind of love. When we go, hey, Jesus, this is all I got today. He goes, I still love you the same way. Verse 17, the third time, he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And so Jesus goes, feed my sheep. See, this time it cuts right to the heart of Peter's brokenness. Picture this, a charcoal fire and three questions about Peter's relationship with Jesus. And Peter is right back to the night where his arrogance broke him. It can be painful to have to come face to face with our own sin and brokenness and shame, can't it? But with Jesus, that's where the rebuilding process begins. Because in this moment, for Simon Peter, there's nothing left to hide. There's nothing left to hide, and that's where boldness comes in. See, once arrogance is dead, we can have an accurate view of ourselves, and we can have an accurate view of Jesus. When there's nothing left to hide between us and Jesus, that's where he can start doing his best work to rebuild us for boldness. And that's my story. See, like Peter, for a long time, I thought I could take care of my own brokenness. I said, hey, I've got, I've got that. Or I could hide it, and I wouldn't have to deal with it. But you know what? Hiding and shoving it down, it only lasts for so long, doesn't it? Because eventually what ended up happening was my brokenness would come out sideways in the form of anger or in the form of fear of failure 
or in the form of arrogance. And, and it would come out not on the situations that actually frustrated me. It would come out sideways on the people I care about the most. You know what I'm talking about? Have you ever experienced something like that? But then God gave me an opportunity to come face to face with my own failure a few, a few years ago. I was already following Jesus at this point. I just thought that I could handle it from here, like Jesus, we're good. And I went on a weekend retreat called the Crucible Project. And there's another one that's similar that I staff now. It's called uh, Liminal Work. And on that weekend, I can't tell you what happened there. It's, it's like Vegas. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, or they actually call it Fight Club. They're like, we don't talk about Fight Club, okay? But what I can tell you is that on that weekend, I learned a term for the brokenness that I like to, to hide. And it's called shadow. And shadow is a soul work term for the, the part of my life that I like to hide, repress, or deny. I like to pretend that it's not there. And we all have shadow, don't we, as you hear me say that. The, the word that Jesus used for it would be sin. It's what we've done. It's what's been done to us. It's what we believe about ourselves or God that's outside his will and his purpose for our life. It, it, it's what goes against what Jesus actually wants for us. And what ends up happening in our shadow, the longer that we push it down, it starts to shape and define how we show up in almost every other part of life. And on that weekend, I had to come face to face with my shadow. And I won't tell you the how to on, what, why we, on how we got there or even the specifics of, of what that looked like for me. But what I will share with you is this, that my shadow is that I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. And I'm going to fail. And ultimately, I'm going to let everyone around me down. That's the tape that played through my head over and over and over, and it was crushing me. Have you ever been there? And facing my shadow on that weekend, it was the hardest thing that I've ever walked through. But you know what I found? In a room full of other people who had been through what I was going through, or they were in the same process, it was actually the safest place I'd ever been. Because everybody could look around and go, hey, we're all on the same boat. And what I found in Jesus in that moment was that there was more grace and love available to me on the other side than I ever thought possible when I faced the truth about the extent of my own sin and my own brokenness. And I got to just experience his love and grace in a way that I never had before. And when I came face to face with my brokenness, here's what happened. It's where the rebuilding process with Jesus began. As I surrendered those parts of my life and the events and ideas that had shaped my shadow up to that point, that I'm not good enough, I'm going to fail, and I'll let everyone around me down. When I let Jesus rebuild the parts of my life in those areas, you know what started to come out? Boldness. Because when there's nothing left to hide, man, it's incredibly freeing, isn't it? When there's nothing left to hide, when we come face to face with Jesus and the truth of our own brokenness and experience nothing but grace and love back in our direction, Jesus wills the highest form of good for us and he rebuilds us for something. He rebuilds us for boldness. Men, let me talk to you for a minute. Some of you need to experience something like this, don't you? There's areas of your life where you feel stuck. And you feel like you're in the same cycle of brokenness. And your shadow has defined every part of your life up to this point. If you don't believe me, just ask your wife or someone close to you, okay? Actually, I'm kidding. Don't. Wives, you'll volunteer that information for them later anyway. But coming up May 20th through the 22nd, there's this weekend coming up that Liminal is, is hosting. It's called Men's Unknown Weekend. It's in Como, Colorado. I'm staffing it, and I would love to challenge you to step into a space where you get to work through your shadow. You get to work through your brokenness. Um, you can go to liminalwork.com for some more information on it. And, and women, there are weekends for you too. I'm just not going to be on those staffing them because it wouldn't be a safe place for you to work through that stuff, but you can check out all those details there. And I know some of you may be thinking, man, a weekend in Colorado, that sounds pretty like extreme, Adam, but here's the deal. Some of us need something extreme, don't we? We may just need to get away from our everyday context to deal with some stuff. And this is the safest place I've ever been to do it. Just like Peter on the beach, we might find that when we face our brokenness in a setting where it's safe to do so, there's nothing left to hide. What you might find on the other side is that Jesus is actually rebuilding you for boldness. So that's exactly what he does for Peter in John 21. Going back to verse 15, after Jesus asked Peter if he loves him, each time Jesus uh, calls him back to his purpose for his life. He goes, hey, feed my lambs. Take care of my sheep. Feed my sheep. See, Jesus is referred to as the great shepherd, and his followers, we, we are referred to as sheep. And so Jesus is going, hey, Peter, you know that thing I called you to, that fishers of men, like work of ministry thing? I still want to do that for you. It's your turn now. 
I, I want to work in you so that I can work through you so you can do for others what I'm doing for you. I want you to point them to me and teach them how to follow me and show them that there's a life that can be rebuilt, a life of boldness that they never knew was possible. Point them back to me from here on out. And so, Peter, here's what boldness is going to look like for you, Jesus says in verse 18. He says, very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and you went where you wanted to go. But when you're old, you're going to stretch out your hands and someone else is going to lead you where you do not want to go. And then John offers commentary on this in verse 19. John was kind of stalking Peter and Jesus throughout this whole conversation. If you read the, the, the uh, story in John 21, but it says that, that Jesus said this to Peter to indicate the type of death. Or how about this? The type of boldness by which Peter would live and die in order to glorify God. And then he said to Peter, follow me. Follow me. And he gives the same invitation to us today. See, Jesus is inviting you into a life of boldness, a life that you'd be willing not just to live for Jesus and follow him, but a life you'd be willing to die for. But you won't get there if you can't trust Jesus with your brokenness. We have to trust him with our brokenness. We have to start living in a way that takes those dead and empty parts of our lives and leaves them behind in the grave where they belong. And so Jesus says to Peter, follow me. And it wasn't an invitation in this moment. It was a command. He goes, hey, you're not going to be Simon anymore. From here on out, you're going to be Peter. You're going to be the rock that I want you to be. Your faith will not be shaken. And here's the deal. Peter, he won't get it perfect. But from this point forward, he's hanging on to Jesus. So much so that it led him to his death, claiming that the resurrection of, of his Lord, not just his friend anymore, but his Lord Jesus was true. So you may be wondering, how does this work in our lives, Adam? This is great for Peter, but what about me? I've never been face-to-face -face with Jesus. Uh, here's three things I see in this story on how Jesus rebuilds us for boldness. And you might be able to find others as well, but this is what stood out to me this week. The first one's this. Boldness comes as we face our own brokenness. Boldness comes as we face our own brokenness. See, Jesus, he meets us in the middle of our brokenness. We, we have to address the mess in our lives. And ultimately, there's healing that's available on the other side of hiding. But boldness will only come. Boldness will only come when with Jesus, there's nothing left to hide. And, and so for some of us, man, we've been hanging out around church for a while. We've been hanging out around Jesus for a while, but we've never trusted him with our sin. We've never trusted him with our brokenness. We've never trusted him with the parts of our lives that we wish weren't there. Some of you in the next few weeks, you need to take that step. Or it's next weekend, it's baptism weekend, saying, Jesus, I believe that you died to take this sin from me, that you've got a better life for me. You're not trying to take anything from me now except my sin. You're trying to lead me into a better life that's better for me and better for all the people around me. And so some of you, you need to take that step next week in a place in your faith in Jesus and expressing it through baptism. Or maybe you need to get away. Maybe you've been following Jesus for a while, but... Your shadow, it, it's still hanging there, isn't it? And it keeps coming up, and it keeps coming out sideways on people. Maybe you need to go on a liminal weekend or something like that. Or maybe it's on an everyday scale. The Bible teaches the way that we deal with this is we confess our sin. We confess it to the people that we trust, and we ask them to pray for us. And what God promises on the other side of that is healing. And there's nothing left to hide. There's boldness that comes from that. And ultimately, it comes because... We know Jesus' love for us. See, boldness comes as we know Jesus' love for us. Jesus loves us. Like, he really loves us. And, and he wills the highest good in our direction. And that's not contingent on our ability or the level at which we love him back. But it's a reckless love like we're going to sing about here in a few minutes. One that comes in our direction first. One that chooses us before we choose him. Love that was so great that it led Jesus to a cross to take on your sin, your shame, and your brokenness so you could be rebuilt for something greater. And the last thing, boldness comes as we follow Jesus, wherever he leads us. See, in John 21, Peter almost gets sidetracked here. He almost gets sidetracked because he sees John and he starts comparing his life to John's life. And he goes, hey, Jesus, I know you said that I'm going to go die, but what about him? And here's the thing with Jesus, and Jesus knows this, comparison crushes our confidence. Comparison crushes boldness. If you don't believe me, just scroll through social media this afternoon and see how you feel about yourself as you start comparing to everybody else, right? Comparison crushes boldness, but boldness actually flows from brokenness. See, out of brokenness, all we have is we can just look at Jesus, and so Jesus says to Peter, hey, what is it to you what I do with him? I'm working that out between him and me. What I want to work out is between you and me. 
And Peter, you must follow me. So what Jesus is inviting us to do is follow him wherever he leads us. See, ultimately for Peter, it's going to come down to this. In, in 1 Peter chapter 3, Peter wrote a couple letters in his life after he started following and experiencing Jesus, and, and he explained a bold life this way in, in 1 Peter 3, verse 13. He goes, who's going to harm you if you're eager to do good? Who's going to harm you? But even if you do suffer for what's right, because you might, and ultimately Peter did, in those moments you're blessed, so don't fear their threats. Do not be frightened, but in your hearts revere Christ as what? Lord, he's in charge of your life. No matter what's going on around you, Jesus is still on the throne. No matter how people around you choose to live in marriage or with their money or when it comes to moral issues or life or parenting, no matter what choices other people make, no matter their orientations, philosophies, biases, no matter if the world or culture or people defile everything you believe to be true about yourself or about Jesus, you can be bold in holding on to Jesus as Lord and you can be confident that he is Lord and you can serve him. How? In your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Nobody can take that from you. That's a bold life. And so Peter continues, always be prepared to give what? An answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. So when does Peter say to give an answer? When someone asks, right? Think about it. What precedes an answer? A question. A question. So let me ask you. When was the last time someone asked you about the hope that you have? In other words, are you living your life in a way that's worth questioning? Or does it just look like everyone else's? Peter would challenge us with this. Do you live a questionable life? Which might be a funny way to say that in church, right? But do you live a questionable life? See, sometimes we live in a way that we go, man, I'm going to offer an answer before anybody's even asking. What Peter's saying is live your life in such a way that they want to ask a question. They want to know about the hope. It's, it's intriguing. It's a curious life. A bold life is a questionable life. A bold life is a questionable life. And then Peter tells us the posture with which we should do this. He says, do it with gentleness and respect. Why? Because that's how Jesus met him on the beach that day in the middle of his greatest failure. And keep a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. So yeah, people may look at you and go, you're crazy for that. Like that whole Jesus coming out of the grave thing, that's nuts. But Peter goes, man, hang on to the life that God's called you to, a bold life. Why? Because in Christ, one day, Jesus will prove that there's wisdom in how you live. And they'll be ashamed of their slander, maybe even turning to Jesus. So where did Peter learn this? He spent time with his friend Jesus. He saw him turn water into wine for a wedding party that was already in full swing. Why would you do that, Jesus? Because I love you and I want you to know who I am. He saw Jesus go to parties with tax collectors and sinners and identified as their friend because he wanted to rebuild their broken lives. He saw Jesus sit down with a woman at a well who had had five husbands, and the man that she was with was not her husband, and she continued to sleep with the wrong people again and again and again, and Jesus went to, to go be with her to rebuild her life, to give her a different life. Guess what kind of life she lived? A life of boldness. She went and told the whole village about this Jesus who had found her. And ultimately, Peter saw his friend Jesus come out of the grave alive, and Peter went to his death, not just claiming Jesus is my friend, but he's my Lord and he's my Savior. He can lead into a better way to do life. He wants to rebuild you for a life of boldness. See, Peter was there when broken people were being rebuilt. And he also remembered what it was like to be there on that day when his friend Jesus met him and rebuilt his life. See, for Peter, it came down to this, a bold life, is a questionable life. For some of us, it's choosing to say yes to Jesus and being baptized, even as an adult, as humbling as that is. When you come face to face with your own brokenness, guess what happens? Your friends start asking what? Questions like, why in the world would you do that? And you go, because Jesus is changing my life. He met me in my brokenness and he's rebuilding my life. Or, or it may look like this. Why the heck do we do crazy surveys around here to reveal like all of our stuff that we're all in the same boat? Why? 
Because we actually trust Jesus with our brokenness. And we want to learn to trust each other with it as well so that we can be rebuilt for boldness. That's why our church serves through schools and other organizations. Because when we show up in those settings, they go, why are you here? It's an opportunity to give an answer. We want to live questionable lives. It's why in in our neighborhood back in Indiana, we threw parties. And people would go, Adam, Ashley, why do you do this? And then they would show up in our living room to start working through the messiness and the brokenness of their lives. It's why in our new neighborhood, we're kind of doing the same thing. Because we want to have an opportunity to give an answer. It's why I challenge you to go on a liminal weekend. Because I promise you this, after you face your shadow, after you face your brokenness, you won't come back the same. People will ask you, hey, what's different about you? And you know what they're going to see in you? They're going to see a boldness that they've never seen before. You'll live a questionable life because you've come face to face with your own brokenness and there's nothing left to hide. Boldness flows from that. In fact, Peter, even in this death, that Jesus promised to meet face. Peter lived by this principle. See, church history teaches us that Peter, he did go to death for his faith in Jesus, claiming the resurrection to be true. His execution method, crucifixion, just like Jesus. Only for Peter, he goes, I can't be crucified the same way he was. Flip me upside down. I don't know if this was actually a picture of the day or not, but it's what Google says, okay? But Peter, in that moment, he goes, man, I'm not worthy to be crucified the way my Lord was. Flip me upside down. And even in his death, Peter was giving every person executing him an opportunity to get to know the story of Jesus. Even in his death, Peter was living a questionable life. Why? Because a bold life is a questionable life. Let's pray. God, thanks for this morning. And man, thank you that we can, we can have confidence, we can have boldness, Jesus, as you work in our lives, as we realize that there's nothing to hide anymore, that you meet us right where we're at, and you give us everything that we need before we even ask. You give us what we don't deserve, and that's a love that you've willed in our direction, and it's the highest form of love. And as we come face to face with our brokenness, God, I just pray that you would do the work only you can do in us to lead us into a life of boldness together. Would you help us see that no one's too far gone, no one's too messed up, that Jesus, you came, in fact, that you from our brokenness. You want to use that part of our lives to rebuild us. You want to use it for boldness. So would you just meet us here and teach us in these few moments about what's true about you and how you want us to walk out of here, what you want for us. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen.